All right. So last time we saw this very interesting example of the Bayes rule. All right, and here there is an example where you have 99% probability, uh, you know, testing for testing positive if you are a drug consumer, and 99% probability for testing negative if you are a non-consumer. And yet, when you do all the calculations, you see that if you tested positive, um, uh, you know, the probability that you are a consumer of a drug is very low. It is just 33%. Okay, this is hopeless because this is less than 50%. It is worse than a coin toss, all right. So this is called the false positive paradox. Why is it a paradox? Because naively speaking, one tends to think that hey, 99 and 99, these are great numbers, all right. But this shows that indeed in this case they are not. And the reason is that the proportion of drug consumers in society, okay, fortunately is very small, all right. And uh, this is a repercussion of that small uh, value, okay. So, of course, that is only one way of looking at it. The other way is that you need a better accuracy uh, for testing on non-consumers. So, this 99 is not enough. You need 99.999 and stuff like that, okay. So, you can try it out. You can plug in other values, all right. So, that 0 0.01 will change. It will become smaller and smaller. As 0 0.01 becomes smaller, uh, that particular term ceases to dominate the denominator. And so, this ratio overall will tend towards 100 percent okay, or 99 percent and then that is fine. Okay. So, there are many more such nice examples of the false positive paradox on Wikipedia. I urge you to read it. Okay. It is extremely interesting. All right. There are lots of other examples. All right. So, we are going to do one more example of a probability paradox. You will see more examples of paradoxes in assignments and quizzes and they will all pop up in different places. Okay, But here is one more. So, uh, so the paradox is like this. Okay, You have n people in a room and you want to determine the least value of n such that the probability that at least two people in the room share the same birthday is 99.9 percent. .9%, all right. So, when I say share the same birthday, what I mean is uh, I am chopping off the year. I am only looking at the month and the date. Okay? So, I am not considering which year you were born. All right? So, you want, uh, you know, you want to find the least value of n, okay? such that that probability is at least 99.9 percent. .9%. All right? So, before we go on, you know, suppose I change that 99.9 .9 to 100. Okay? What should n be? 366. 366. Okay. So, this is called, this is by what? It is called the pigeonhole principle in discrete math. Okay. So, for 366 onwards, you know, everything is 100 percent. Okay. But now we are going to, uh, we are not interested in 100 percent. We are going to make it 99.9 .9 or maybe 99 percent. Okay. And anybody wants to take a guess? what this n is going to be? 100, 50, 23, okay? 24. Okay, Okay, that is enough. Okay, I mean as it is we know there are only about 300 choices or so. Okay? Uh, so, the, the candidates are 23, 24, 50, 70, 90, somebody said 90 and 100 also. Okay? So, we will we will see. Okay? So, let us do this calculation. All right. So, uh, each person can have his or her birthday on any one of the 365 days and if there are n people, then there are 365 raised to n total number of outcomes. Okay. Now, the number of outcomes resulting in no two people sharing a birthday. All right. So, if I say that you know no two people can have uh, the same birthday, it is going to be like the first guy is 365, he could be any one of those 365 days. The second person coming in must necessarily be born on any of the other 364 days. So, this is 365 times 364 and like this you can multiply by 363 for the third person and this goes on until 365 minus n plus 1. Okay? So, uh, continuing this the required probability, what is the required probability? You know. Uh, this is 365 times 364 dot 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 all the way to 365 minus n plus 1 divided by 365 raised to n. 
So, what is this ratio? Is the probability of what event? I am not saying 1 minus that, I am just saying that ratio is the probability of which event? No two people sharing a birthday. So, when you take the complement of that event, it means there is at least one pair of people who share a birthday. Okay? And so, what we want is 1 minus this ratio uh, should be uh, 0 0.999. In fact, you know there is a small little typo, this should be greater than or equal to 0 0.999. And obviously, we want the smallest n for which this is true. Okay. So, uh, how are you going to solve this now? Okay. Any guesses? How are you going to solve? I mean, if this were a quadratic equation, you've got this beautiful formula. Okay. Uh, but this is not the case here. Okay. And not only that, n is an integer. Okay. I mean, n being fractional is nonsense. All right. So, n is an integer. So, what are you going to do here? Yes. Which method okay, are you going to use? Pardon me? Trial and error is you are close to the answer. The answer is trial and error. You are kind of close, but you know there is a better way of saying that. Okay. Pardon me? Okay. So, if it is less than, then you are going to increase others. You are going to go sort of. All right. That is that's a fair enough answer. All right. So, basically you can guess a reasonable range for n. All right, and try for every n. All right. So trial and error can mean you know just randomly you choose numbers. All right. So you can try for every n, and you can simulate this in a computer. All right. So you're going to do a computer simulation. All right, and you're going to see what n gives you the value that is closest to 0 0.99. In fact, it should be slightly greater than 0 0.99. And uh, the answer is 70. Okay. So if there are 70 people in this room. Then with 99.9% .9 probability, I can say that there is at least one pair which shares a uh, uh, same birthday. Of course, you know this classroom is an exception because here we have got at least one pair of twin brothers. Okay? I do not know how it is in Goa. Uh, Goa people, do you have twin brothers there or sisters? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so in this class, you know it is, uh, we can ask them to leave temporarily. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Only temporarily. Okay. So, n is 70 in this case, all right, and I uh, will throw some other numbers at you. Okay. So, for n equal to 20, it is around 41 percent, all right, and uh, 40 it is 89 percent. So, you know, in this range from 40 to 70, it grows very rapidly, all right, the probability increases very, very fast, all right. And uh, I will, as always, you know, you should read the uh, Wikipedia article on this, very nice, okay. Uh, this is called the birthday paradox. It is called a paradox because one would not normally expect that with just uh, 70 people, there is such a high chance of sharing the same birthday. Okay, so, the wiki article also gives lots of variants of this problem. Okay. So, uh, you know here there are only two type of people, you know sharing the same birthday, you know, but then you sort of do divide and rule, you know you uh, divide the people into men and women. And then no two men sharing the same birthday, and no two women, and man versus woman, and all these kinds of things. Okay, there are many many variants of this problem. If you're interested, this is a lovely article to read. Okay, so uh, as an aside, you know what is the use of doing these kinds of things? All right. So uh, in the data structures course, you will learn a concept called as hashing. Okay, have you learned it already? What is hashing? Okay. So, you learn, you learn very soon, okay, hashing and hash collisions, all right. So, this birthday paradox stuff has some relationship with hashing and hash collisions. So, for now, you can just make a mental note. You know, another way of uh, framing this problem is if you had to generate numbers from 1 through to 365 randomly, okay, and uh, of course, numbers could repeat, all right. So, what is the smallest number of numbers you generate for which there is a high probability of a repetition occurring. That is another way of framing this problem. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we will select 365 numbers and then it is exactly the same problem. Okay. Only thing words like birthday and stuff like that have been erased, okay. but essentially it is the same problem. So, I am putting this problem also on the assignment. Okay. So, I want you to simulate this for yourself and plot a graph of n versus this probability. Okay, that is one of the problems in the assignment which is going to be out tonight or to today evening. Okay.
is due on the 11th. Okay, so the reason I am framing this is I want you to fiddle around with MATLAB or Scilab. Okay, Goa students, Scilab, Bombay students, MATLAB. Okay, and figure out how to do this product uh, nicely. Okay, so you have to do this product iteratively, and you should not write C styled MATLAB code. Okay, it should be MATLAB styled MATLAB code. Okay, so this this will get you used to writing code of that kind. Okay. All right, so we are done with this chapter very fast. Okay. All right, so we are going to begin this new topic. So this chapter is called random variables. I think we will spend a good three or four lectures on this topic. Okay. Okay. So let's do. Uh, I'll just give you an overview. What is it that we are going to do? All right. So uh, we're going to see what is this concept called random variable. And we are going to look at discrete and continuous random variables. After that, I am going to define two very, very important concepts called as the probability density function and the cumulative distribution function, PDF. Okay, here is a new meaning for the word PDF. Okay, PDF and CDF. All right, then we are going to look at joint uh, CDFs, conditional PDFs, conditional CDFs. All right, then we are going to look at concepts like expectation. Okay, expected value is something very similar to the mean that we've studied earlier, and then again we will look at mean, uh, we we'll look at variance and something called covariance, and we we'll look at Chebyshev's inequality yet again from a different perspective. All right, and then there are few more concepts: the weak law of large numbers uh, and moment generating functions. Okay, so this is a fairly longish uh, chapter. All right. It is, I think, the fourth chapter in your textbook. All right. So, without further further ado, let's uh, begin. Okay. So, what is this thing called a random variable? All right. Uh, in many random experiments, we are not always interested in just the observed value, but we may be interested in a numerical quantity that is determined or derived from the observed values. Okay. So. To give you an example, okay, uh, let us say I am throwing um, a, a dice multiple times, and I may be interested in quantities like the sum of the values uh, on the dice throws, or the number of heads appearing in some n consecutive coin tosses. All right, so uh, I mean there can be many many such examples, okay. Maybe the square of the maximum value on a dice throw. All right. I may be, for whatever reason, interested in the square of the maximum value. So I'm going to throw the dice some ten times, and I want to determine you know, what that value is. So any such quantities determined by the results of random experiments are called random variables. And remember, these are random experiments. Okay, when you throw a dice. It could attain any one of the six values. You really can't predict. Okay, I mean, of course, one could really uh, tediously study the physics: what position was your hand in, and the wind, and all that. But you know, you can't really do these kinds of things. All right. So that is why one resorts to randomness, okay, or statistics. So uh, such quantities are determined by the results of random experiments, and they are called random variables. All right, and of course. Uh, these random variables may be the observations themselves. All right. So I'm saying uh, they need not be the observations, but they could also be the observations. Okay? So I may be interested in individual values. I may also be interested in the average value. Okay, uh, and so on. Right? Any questions or comments about this? Okay. So. Uh, you know, here is uh, uh, a random variable capital X, okay, uh, where X is the sum of two dice throws, all right. So one to six. So obviously, uh, you know, the maximum value can be twelve and the minimum value can be two. And uh, here I've written the pr probability that capital X attains a value small x, okay. The small x can range from two to twelve, and these are the different probability values. Okay, 
So, this particular table is called as a probability mass function table PMF all right. It is called the PMF probability mass function uh, of the random variable capital X all right. So, if S is the sample space then obviously P S is equal to P of the union of all the events of the form capital X equal to little x and naturally this is going to turn out to be 1. All right. So, when random variable x attains a value little x that is an event all right that is an event all right. So, capital X is notation for a random variable and little x is a notation for the value it may attain and in this case the values are ranging from 2 to 12 they are all integers ok. All right. So, upper case for random variable lower case for the value. Does the value have to be numerical always? Does it have to be a numerical value little x? No ok. Imagine a random experiment where I assigned grades to people ok. So, then the values are you know the A, 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 B, A, P, B, C, B, B whatever ok. So, they need not be numerical. Ok, and random variables are of two types ok. One is the discrete random variable ok. So, these are values which can be written as a finite and sometimes an a countably infinite sequence ok. I should say countably infinite sequence ok. Uh, and these are discrete random variables ok. Results of a coin toss, uh, random dice experiments, grids ok and so on. All right. So, these are discrete random variables and the probability that a random variable x I mean a discrete random variable x takes on a value little x it is denoted as p of capital X equal to x and this is called the probability mass function ok. This is standard notation or standard terminology yeah any questions or comments. Ok, so one kind of random variable is discrete the other is continuous ok. So, random variables that can take on values within a continuum but they are called as continuous random variables. So, for example, you know I asked you to pick a real number from 0 to 1 all right then you cannot list uh, these numbers as a sequence ok. This is an uncountable infinity you have studied this in discrete structures. You cannot make a list of numbers from 0 to 1 real numbers I mean without missing numbers ok you simply cannot do it. So, you know these are called as continuous random variables all right. So, you know typically the dimensions of an object the height, the weight, the width these are all continuous quantities ok. The amount of water in a jar all right in a 4 liter jar let us say it could be a random number from 0 to 4 it could can be anything. Of course, measuring devices have finite resolution ok, but measuring devices have only a finite resolution you often cannot get exact values ok you cannot measure them. But what the, the amount of water in the jar will be a continuous uh, value ok will attain a continuous value ok. So, now you know here is a very very important bullet ok and this is sometimes a little bit counterintuitive. ok. For a continuous random variable the probability that the random variable takes on a particular value within the continuum is 0 all right. So, suppose I asked you to take a number from 0 to 1 let us say 0 0.12344 4, ok. The value uh, uh, the probability that you will pick this particular value is basically 1 by infinity you know, 0 ok. So, a particular value the probability of the that the random variable attains that particular value is 0 ok and this is something for uh, continuous random variables. You know discrete case is much more well behaved ok. So, in discrete case the probability that you will get so and so grade you know, that is not 0 that is some non 0 quantity ok right and why is this? So, there are infinitely many right? and here we are assuming of course, that each is equally likely and stuff like that ok. All right, so I must tell you one thing: zero probability in the case of continuous random variables does not mean that the event will never occur. All right, so 
you could well pick the number 0 0.12344 okay it is just that you will pick it with an extremely small probability and that extremely small is basically 0 okay so zero probability does not mean that the event will never occur okay this is something for continuous random variables for a discrete random variable if i say that it's occurring with zero probability it means that it's really not going to occur okay so this is a subtle distinction that you have to bear in mind all right so now since continuous random variables attain a particular value in the continuum with zero probability okay then that is an uninteresting concept okay instead it is uh, more useful to uh, consider what is called as the cumulative distribution function or sometimes it is just called the distribution function and it's uh, abbreviated as cdf okay so the cdf is defined as the probability that x attains a value less than or equal to x okay so little x is some value and this is the probability that capital x is less than or equal to x and this is often denoted as capital f sub x at little x okay so this notation means what is the cdf of the random variable capital x at the value little x so uh, this is the probability that capital x is less than or equal to little x all right so the cdf uh, has lots and lots of applications okay the most immediate one uh, one application is the cdf can be used to compute what is called as the cumulative interval measure okay which is basically the probability that capital x takes on a value uh, from a to b in fact greater than a and less than or equal to b so that is given as fx b minus fx a Right, fx of b minus fx of a so remember this fx is a function all right it's a function of what of the values that capital x is uh, x can possibly take all right so this is also jargon statistics jargon cumulative interval measure okay cdf is another jargon random variable discrete and continuous random variable is all jargon okay jargon means what terminology that is frequently used okay any questions all right let me ask you suppose you know i chopped off this uh, uh, you know this soft inequality and made it a hard inequality capital x less than x what is going to happen in the continuous case nothing really happens okay because any particular value is zero probability so it really doesn't matter okay in the discrete case yes certainly it matters okay okay so let's do one tiny little exercise okay just to get your hands and feet wet in this concept okay so we're going to consider a cdf which is defined as follows fx x is 0 if x is less than or equal to 0 and it is 1 minus e raised to minus x square otherwise okay that's the way i'm defining my cdf and i want you to find the probability that x exceeds 1 Okay, so think, I will just give you a minute. Alright, so solution is here. Okay, so pr probability of x greater than 1 is 1 minus p x less than or equal to 1, and that is 1 minus fx of 1, which is basically 1 minus 1 minus e raised to minus 1. Okay, so the 1s cancel out. So 1 by e. Okay. But it's simple enough, right? Now we're going to look at a very important concept. Okay, this is called as the probability density function (PDF). Okay, so the PDF of a random variable x at a value x is basically the derivative of its CDF at that value x. Okay, of course, here I'm assuming that the derivative exists. In cases where it doesn't exist, we will take up that case little bit later. Okay. So basically, the PDF I'm claiming is a non-negatively valued function f(x). This is denoted as little f(x) x. Okay. Such that so how do you define the PDF? It's the non-negative function f(x) of little x 
such that for any set of real numbers, we have probability x belonging to b is integral f x x dx over this uh, over b. Okay, this is over uh, this set b. That's where I'm taking that integral. Okay. So, why am I you know sort of very uh, confidently claiming non-negative function, okay. right. The cumulative is strictly non-decreasing, okay. it is a strictly non-decreasing function. So, consequently when you take the derivative it cannot be negative, right. Okay. Now, there are other properties uh, of the PDF, okay. The integral of the PDF from minus infinity to infinity is 1 basically, alright that is 1. Then the probability that x takes on values from a to b is basically integral from a to b f x x dx and uh, you know the integral of little f x is capital F x. So, I can write this, uh, this is a definite integral, this is f x b minus f x a, alright. So, this is, this equation is an example of what I earlier showed you here, where set b is basically the set of numbers from little a to little b, right. And probability that x is equal to a is nothing but the integral of a to a of f x x dx, so that is 0. Yeah, so this uh, PDF stuff, you know, has interpretations in terms of areas. So here is uh, one arbitrarily chosen uh, probability density function. All right, so little x is on the x-axis, on the y-axis we have f(x) of x, and this is how the graph looks like. Uh, this particular random variable is. Uh, taking values only in a finite range, you know, from some value here all the way through to here, and beyond that, uh, the density function is zero. All right, so density function in those areas is zero. So in those areas, the the probabilities are also zero. In any finite range, the probability is going to be zero. The area beneath the blue curve, in between the lines x equal to a and x equal to b is basically the cumulative interval measure, alright. So, it is the probability that x is from a to b, alright. So, there is a nice geometric interpretation of, uh, of a cumulative interval measure, okay. And moreover, f x a into d x is the probability that the random variable x takes on values between a and a plus d x, where d x is something very small right it's something very very small and in fact this particular formula we are going to see again all right uh, over here so here is another way of looking at the same concept okay if i computed the probability that x takes on values from a minus epsilon by 2 to a plus epsilon by 2 so that you know is a minus epsilon by 2 integral all the way to a plus epsilon by 2 f x x dx and this is approximately equal to epsilon f a, right. Uh, how can I write this? By what can I write this? This is, there is a name for this. Mean value, mean value theorem, okay. So, uh, anyways, uh, if I divide Okay, so this is an approximation, but the approximation becomes more and more accurate as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller. In fact, this is basically your de definition of de differentiation. So f a, uh, this should be f x a by the way. Okay. I forgot the capital X here. F x a. So f x a is limit epsilon tends to zero. Sorry, limit epsilon tends to zero. This probability divided by epsilon. Okay. So, this is basically the derivative definition, alright and the very nice thing is there is a nice interpretation in terms of areas for this concept. So, in when it comes to uh, 
continuous random variables ok. Nobody looks at these types of probabilities because we all know they are trivially 0. Instead one looks at either the CDF or in many applications the PDF. Many applications one looks at the PDF alright and that is what we are also going to do. So, uh, before we move on ok, how many of you have seen the concept of a PDF before? Anybody in this class? One person. Uh, so, I am curious where have you seen it? You have done it, are you are you taking a math spinal? Alright, so all this stuff basically is clearly it is JEE plus plus, ok, right. Alright, so there are many many interesting families of PDFs, ok. I will explain the word family in this context. So, this is uh, an extremely popular PDF, it is called the Gaussian. It is named after the mathematician from Germany, his name was Gauss, ok. And it is also called the normal PDF and in colloquial terms it is called as the bell curve. You may have heard this word the bell curve ok. So, it is called the bell curve because indeed it is shaped like a bell right. So, it is uh, so this basically uh, you know this blue curve tells you a Gaussian PDF with mean mu which is 0 and standard deviation sigma alright. So, in this case uh, for the blue curve the sigma squared was 0.2 alright and this sigma is the same as the standard deviation sigma that we have earlier studied ok. So, you know this is the formula for a Gaussian PDF and mu and sigma are called as the parameters of the PDF. Ok, so what do I mean by family of PDFs? Family consists of functions all having this particular form, but every member of that family will have different values of mu and sigma. In fact, I should say mu and uh, mu or sigma. So, if I change mu or I change sigma, but not both, I am going to get a totally different PDF. Ok, so here is an example a red curve this red curve has a higher standard deviation in this case it is 1 and you can see that this bell curve is shortening out and it is flattening out. So, obviously you have seen this kind of stuff before you know this is a higher variance it is more spread out and then I can go to this dark yellowish brown curve ok and this is even a larger sigma which is in this case root 5 and the mean remains the same. Ok. I can of course also shift the mean, I am shifting the mean to minus 2 and uh, variance is uh, 0.5 ok. So, all these are different examples or different family members of the Gaussian family ok. So, uh, later on in this class many lectures down the line we are going to see why anybody should think of inventing a formula like this ok. So, there is a very nice reason why somebody thought of creating this formula. It is not that you know you wanted to just kill time when you invent some formula ok. It actually emerges from uh, a very nice statistical application ok. Alright, any questions or comments about this? So, do you understand what I mean by this family of PDFs? Here is another ok. This is called as the bounded uniform PDF ok and remember here capital X is a continuous random variable ok, uh, not a discrete one. I am specifically referring to continuous random variable here. So, what does this PDF say? This uh, fx x is 1 over b minus a where b is uh, strictly greater than a alright. Uh, so, this is in the range where little x takes on values from a to b and otherwise it is 0 ok. Somewhere in this class ok, in the last 4 lectures we have come across this kind of a concept ok. Somewhere, can you tell me where? Yes, say that. 
rand you know when i did the matlab demo last class or before last week okay so rand generates numbers from 0 to 1 okay so in that case b is 1 a is 0 and rand is basically generating numbers from this pdf okay questions so there are lots and lots of families of this kind not only for continuous random variables, even for discrete random variables, there are lots and lots of different types of families of PMFs over there, not PDFs, PMFs in that case. Okay. So, we are going to study lots of them in this class. Okay. So, next concept, the expected value or expectation of a random variable. It is also called the mean value of the random variable. So, for a discrete random variable x, it is defined as summation over i x i p x equal to x i. So, x i is the ith value of the random variable capital X. So, what is this expectation? You are just basically taking a weighted summation of the values x i and what are the weights? The weights are nothing but the PMF values. For a continuous random variable, for a continuous random variable, the definition is expectation of x is integral minus infinity to infinity x fx x dx. Alright, now when we are using the word expected value in statistics, okay, it should not be confused with colloquialism. Okay. So, for instance, when we use the word expected in everyday life, okay, we basically mean that you know that is something that we really expect to happen very often. All right. When you say my expected grade in this course is an AP, it means that you feel that really you are going to get an AP. All right. But that is not what is the same as the um, expected value in this particular case. The expected value here is an average. All right. It is an average. All right. So, for discrete and continuous, the the Concepts are analogous, but they are not exactly the same. Okay. The method of calculation is, is different. Now, you know, moment you get into the continuous domain, into the domain of continuous random variables, okay, very, very strange things can happen, all right. They, they go against intuition. For example, there are certain PDFs for which the expected value is not always well defined. In other words, it can be infinity. So, in other words, the integral below may not have a finite value. So, negative infinity to infinity x f x x dx may not have a finite value. All right, and uh, these are really path pathological cases. For most PDFs that we will come across in this class, we will not have this problem. But there are these kinds of PDFs for which the mean or the expected value is not defined. All right. So, I just want you to be aware because this is a question that otherwise does come up. So, I have added this slide uh, specifically. So, there is something called as the Pareto PDF and uh, it has this formula f x x parameterized by alpha and x m. So, alpha and x m are like the mu and the sigma for the Gaussian that we saw earlier. And this is basically alpha x m raised to alpha divided by x raised to alpha plus 1 in the event that little x is greater than or equal to xm, otherwise it is 0. So, this is a definition of that Pareto family of PDFs. Okay? And in this particular case, the expected value of capital X is actually infinity if alpha is less than 1. Okay? Can you work this out? Take a minute and just work this out. I will also work it out. So, e of x is basically minus infinity to infinity x f x x.
So, you know when I uh, when I write this notation you know this uh, vertical line and alpha x m this means these are parameters of that pdf it should not be confused with a conditional probability ok alpha and x m are fixed values. In fact, I can write this as not negative infinity to infinity, but just x m to infinity. Okay, now if you see this part, this is constant, x m is a constant, okay. So it comes outside the integral, and all you are left with is uh, basically alpha x m raised to alpha in integral x m raised to infinity x raised to minus alpha dx. And this is alpha x m raised to alpha x raised to 1 minus alpha ranging from infinity to x m right. And if alpha is less than 1 right this is the case we are considering alpha is less than 1. So now let us look at that x raised to 1 minus alpha that is going to be infinity raised to some point 0.2 or point 0.3 some 1 minus alpha and clearly that is infinity right. So, this is infinity okay. when alpha is less than 1. Right? If alpha is equal to 1 or let, let us say greater than 1 what happens? If alpha is greater than 1 then you will get something like 1 over infinity that is 0 that is not a problem. Alright, so in those cases the Pareto PDF does not have an undefined expectation. In this particular case when alpha is less than 1 it has, okay. Alright, so this is uh, this is one pathological case where these kind of infinities occur, right. There are also other examples, okay. So, you know in the realm of continuous random variables you can get these kind of cases. If it is a discrete random variable which takes on finite values then there is no problem ok. If there are only finitely many values the expected value is always well defined ok. However, if there are infinitely many values the expected value may not be defined because this summation, this summation may produce an, a value that is infinity. And here is an example, okay. Suppose my probability mass function is defined as p x equal to x equal to some k by x squared for x greater than or equal to 1 and x belonging to z plus. Z plus is what? Positive integers, alright, only integers, right. That is why it is discrete. So, uh, in this case, e x is equal to summation over little x equal to 1 through to infinity x p x equal to x which is basically k times summation x over x squared which is 1 by x. So, this series ok summation from 1 to infinity 1 over x this is actually a divergent series ok. One can prove that this summation uh, does not have a finite value infinity ok. So, this link over here contains that proof ok. Uh, I do not want to get into that proof because it it goes on a digression from the main theme of the class ok, but uh, you, you are encouraged to look at it alright. So, this summation over x 1 over x well known divergent series it does not have a finite summation. Uh, as an aside ok, just as a tiny little digression if this were x squared then stuff is much better behaved ok. And you can I am not going to prove this because it is not so important for us, but you can take a look if you are interested. Alright, so basically the, the reason for these slides uh, you, you know for uh, for this example the, the one on the previous slide and slide 17 and slide 18 is that uh, basically the expected value uh, sometimes is not defined. 
hopefully we will not encounter these kind of cases too often in this class ok. Let us see some simple examples before we move on ok. So, the expected value that shows up when you throw a dice it is uh, obviously 1 over 6 uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. So, that is 3.5 ok. So, let me tell you the expected value uh, this is a discrete random variable the expected value uh, is not necessarily in the set of outcomes ok. It is some fractional value here ok. Uh, any comments or questions? Alright, let us one more, uh, let us see one more example ok. So, this is the game of roulette ok, which sometimes you see in a casino ok. So, what is this roulette ok, the roulette wheel looks like this ok, this is a wheel which you have to turn around alright. And uh, uh, so, uh, at the side of the wheel there are 38 numbers alright and uh, so, you are going to turn the wheel and there is a particular mark ok and you are going to pick the number which falls at that mark let us say this one alright. So, uh, if the number that arrives over there is the same one as what you earlier guessed. So, when you are playing roulette you have to guess a number and then you turn the wheel and if the wheel falls on the same number then you win uh, uh, 35 dollars ok and otherwise you lose 1 dollar alright. So, this is gambling basically alright and uh, the expected value of the amount you earn after one trial is basically you know with a probability of 37 by 38 you will lose because there are 38 numbers ok and the one that you guessed may not be the one that arrives over there ok. So, it is 37 by 38 times minus 1 uh, and uh, there is the probability that you will win 35 dollars is 1 by 38. So, that is 35 right and if you do the math you see that the expected value is minus 0 0.0526 dollars. So, in an expectation you are going to lose a tiny amount of money ok. That is why they allow you to play these kind of things ok All right. So, that the casino wins money ultimately when you lose you have to give the casino that money ok. All right. right. So, this is called roulette yeah any questions about expected value ok. So, remember expected value is not the mode ok. It is not the most frequently occurring value it is the average value and look at the way averages are being computed ok. Uh, it is not minus 1 plus 35 divided by 2 no ok that is not appropriate because the event 35 occurs with a far lower probability than the event of minus 1 ok. So, you have to account for that as well right all right any questions now we can we've talked about random variables now there is the concept of the of a function of a random variable the function of a random variable actually produces another random variable in its own right so in this case it is gx okay starting from random variable x you applied some operation g x onto it. So, the expected value of g x is defined as follows ok. E g x is summation over i g x i p x equal to x i this is the expectation of g x. In the discrete case in the continuous case it is defined like this is g x f x x d x from minus infinity to infinity ok. Let us move on properties of expected value or we are going to look at and fool around with some properties here ok. The expected value of a g x plus b we are going to we are going to do something about this. So, this is basically uh, minus infinity to infinity integral a g x plus b f x x d x alright. So, we are just plugging in the formula earlier and this now we can split over the two summations. So, we get a g x f x x d x integral plus b f x x d x 
So, I can take this. So, a and b are constants over here. They are not functions of little x. So, I can safely take out a and b from the integrals. And then if I take out a from this integral, all is that is left is integral minus infinity to infinity g x f x x d x and that is e g x. And likewise, this is b coming out and infinite minus infinity to infinity f x x d x is 1, all right. It is it's defined to be 1. So, that is b, all right. So, this is called as the linearity of the expected value. So, in general a function f x is said to be linear in x if f of a x plus b is a f x plus b where a and b are constants, they are not functions of x. So, this is uh, usual terminology. So, in this particular case what are we saying? The expected value is not a function, but it is an operator all right. It is an operator because uh, you know it is taking an entire function as input. It is like a function of a function, right. So, the operator E is said to be linear if E A f x plus B is A E f x plus B, right. So, the expectation operator satisfies that property and this turns out to be very useful in many, many problems, okay. That is why I am defining it, all right. So, we are going to now go further. So, properties of expected value, suppose you wanted to predict the value of a random variable with a known mean. On an average, what value will yield the least uh, squared error, all right. So, let capital X be the random variable and C be its predicted value, all right. So, we want to find C such that X minus C squared expected value is minimized, all right. So, mu is the uh, mean of x, okay. So, mu is equal to expected value of x, all right. Now, listen to what we are trying to do, okay. What are we trying to do over here? We want to find, uh, you, you want to determine a value c such that if c were a guess for the value of capital X the average error is minimized. Now, how do I define error? It is x minus c whole squared, all right. But I am not interested only in the error, I am interested in the average error or the expected error. Why am I talking about expected error over here? Why am I not just saying x minus c squared? Think about it. What is x? x is a random variable. It is not any, it is not a deterministic variable. It is a random variable. So, it can attain different values every time you run an experiment, right. So, x is cap, capital X is the outcome of an experiment typically, okay, a random experiment. Every time you run the experiment, you are going to get different answers, okay. And on an average, we want to ensure that x minus c the whole squared is minimized. So, that is the question that is being asked over here, okay. So, it is going to turn out to be the expected value that is mu. The answer that we are going to get is c is equal to mu. We are going to prove it, okay. So, the expected value is the value that yields the least mean squared prediction error, right. So, c is the predicted value of capital X. So, let us go on. So, we want E expectation, I mean expectation of x minus c squared, which is basically expectation of x minus mu plus mu minus c whole squared. I am adding and subtracting mu. So, I am going to open out the brackets. So, I get expectation of x minus mu squared plus mu minus c squared plus 2 x minus mu mu minus c. Okay, so let me write this out. So, what are we looking at? We are looking at expectation of x minus mu squared plus mu minus c squared plus twice x minus mu mu minus c. 
what next should I do? Ultimately, I want to find a C that minimizes this guy. Okay. So, what am I going to do? I am going to use the linearity of expectation and write this out as E of x minus mu squared plus E of mu minus c squared plus twice E of x minus mu mu minus c. Right? Why can I do this? It is because of the linearity of the expectation operator that I am allowed to write this step. Okay, now what I am going to do is I am going to further simplify. So, E of x minus mu squared I am going to leave as is. What is E of mu minus c squared? This is nothing but mu minus c squared. Why? Right, mu and c are both constants. Please remember, they are not random variables. Okay, I am being very emphatic. They are not random variables. Mu is not a random variable. Mu is the expected value of a random variable, but it is not a random variable. Okay. Uh, all right. So that is just mu minus c squared. And now let's look at the last term. What am I going to do to this last term which I have underlined in black? Yes, yeah, mu minus c again is a constant. So, I am going to take it out and I get E of x minus mu. Okay, now what happens to this guy? Why is it 0? linearity from linearity E x okay, minus E mu. All right, E x is mu and E mu is also mu. All right, so that is basically 0. So, what we are left with is E of x minus mu squared plus mu minus c squared. All right, so what have we proved? We have proved that this quantity which was E x minus mu squared is basically equal to, uh, I am sorry, x minus c squared is basically x minus mu squared expectation plus mu minus c squared. All right, now one step is required and the proof is done, not required. See, this quantity is non-negative, okay, uh, and the lowest value it can attain is zero, and that's going to happen when mu is equal to c. All right. So basically, what we're showing is e of x minus c whole squared is greater than or equal to e of x minus mu squared. All right. So, this proof is done. And this proof brings out a significance of the expected value. It is that value that yields the least mean squared prediction error. It is the squared prediction error. What is prediction over here? C is my predicted value. Okay. And on an average, I want C to be as close to X as possible. All right, that is what is going on over here. So, it is very important, okay, you guys, when you go back home, you must look at this derivation and ensure that you understand each and every step. If you do not understand it, please ask me in a timely manner because this kind of stuff we will do again and again and again in this class, all the way up to NSEM and possibly in subsequent courses on machine learning and things like that. So, this is crucial, okay, very, very crucial. For example, you must understand why is it that E of mu minus c squared is equal to mu minus c squared, okay. Think over, think over it. If you do not follow, you are not 100 percent convinced, come and talk to me during office hours or send me email. 
All right, so what is going to happen next? So, we are going to try to minimize this quantity. All right, and what are you going to get? You are going to get the median of x. Okay. Now, uh, the proof of this is a little bit complicated, it is there on these slides, but I am going to skip it for now, take it up next class. Okay. We are going to look at the variance. Okay, the variance of a random variable x tells you how much its values deviate from the mean or how spread out they are from the mean on an average. Okay, so, you know we have seen arithmetic mean earlier, we have seen variance standard deviation earlier, but now we are defining it again uh, with a little bit of rigor since we have with us the concept of a random variable. So, the variance of x is expectation of x minus mu squared. So, the variance of x is the expected value of some other random variable, which is that other random variable x minus mu squared, that is the random variable. So, this is defined as this integral, okay. x minus mu squared f x x dx, how do I get this? is basically straightforward substitution into the definition of E. The positive square root of the variance is the standard deviation, alright and low variance probability mass functions or probability densities tend to be concentrated around one point, high variance densities are spread out. For some distributions or some density functions, the variance and hence the standard deviation may not be defined because the integral may not have a finite value. Which integral? This integral here. And if this were a discrete random variable, this would be uh, substituted by summation. So, you will have summation over i uh, x i minus mu squared f x uh, p of x equal to x i, right. So, the Pareto distribution for alpha less than 2 does not have a well defined uh, variance and I will leave uh, this for you as an exercise, okay. this has infinite variance, there are many many such examples. Okay. So, in some cases the mean is not defined, if the mean is not defined the variance is also not defined, however in other cases the mean is defined but the variance is not, this is one example. In this case, the mean is well defined, you can try it out from what we did just a while ago. So, the mean is defined, but the variance is not. In some cases, both are undefined okay. and of course, if the mean is undefined, then so is the variance. Okay, now, we are going to look at an alternative exp expression for the variance, all right. So, we have got variance of x is E of x minus mu squared and this, this you have seen on the previous slide. However, there is another way of looking at this, variance of x is e of x minus mu squared, which is e of x squared plus mu squared minus 2 x mu and from the linearity of expectation, I am going to write this as e x squared plus e mu squared minus 2 e x times mu. Why could I take this mu out? Because mu is constant, okay, I am repeating mu is the expected value of a random variable, but mu is not a random variable, okay. This sentence that I just spoke is very, very important to understand. All right, so proceeding ahead, this is now e x squared plus mu squared minus 2, this is mu, so minus 2 mu squared and so I get e x squared minus mu squared, which is e x squared minus e x the whole squared. Okay. So, e x squared is different from e x the whole squared also. So, this is an alternative form for the variance and it is also very useful in various applications. Okay. Here we are going to look at some properties of the variance. So, variance of a x plus b is basically expectation of a x plus b minus expectation of a x plus b the whole squared. Okay. So, what is this? This is the mean of a x plus b. 
So, if you open out the brackets, so you get a x plus b minus a mu plus b the whole squared. Right? So, expectation of a x plus b is a e x plus b. So, e x is mu. Okay? So, a little bit of algebra starting from here, you see that the b cancels out. Okay, why does the b cancel out? This b and this b they cancel out, and you basically get e of a square x minus mu squared, which is a square variance of x. If this was standard deviation, it would be standard deviation of a x plus b is a standard deviation of x. All right. So what this is telling you is that a single additive offset on the random variable has no effect on the standard deviation. It will have an effect on the mean, of course it will, but not on the standard deviation. Okay. Right? Any questions or comments? All right. So sometimes we know the mean or variance of a random variable and we want to guess the probability that the random variable takes on a certain value. All right. So uh, the exact probability can usually not be computed as the information is too little. But we can get upper or lower bounds on this probability, which can influence our decisions. Okay? So, remember the mean and the variance alone do not tell you everything about a random variable. Okay? What do you think would tell you everything about the random variable? Yes? PDF. PDF or CDF. If it is discrete, then the PMF. That tells you everything. But the mean and the variance alone do not tell you uh, everything. Okay. So, uh, so but the information that is available to us is just the mean and the variance, and we want to derive certain inferences. All right. So, uh, you know, so like here is an example. All right. So let's say the average annual salary, okay, offered to a CSE BTEC four BTEC four student at IIT Bombay, okay. Is dollar hundred thousand? Okay, I mean, I'm just saying. Let's say, all right. Um, so, what's the probability that a randomly chosen student will get an offer of hundred and ten thousand dollars or more? Uh, and the variance of the salary is fifty thousand. Okay. In addition, if I tell you what's the probability that your package uh, is between ninety thousand and hundred and ten thousand dollars annual package? Okay. All right, so we are obviously going to look at uh, certain probabilistic inequalities. Okay, so what would you use to answer the blue question here? That is Chebyshev. Okay, so we are going to see Chebyshev's inequality uh, in a different form. Okay, uh, and in fact, a much nicer form, I may say. Okay, but look at the first question. All right, this this thing you've not seen so far. All right, and this has the particular answer which I will tell you. It's called Markov's inequality. So, how is it defined? Let x be a random variable that takes on only non-negative values. Okay, so this is only for non-negative random variables. For any a greater than zero, we have the probability of x being greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to e x divided by a. In other words, as your uh, value increases, okay, the uh, what value? Value a. The probability that the random variable can attain a value greater than a, that starts dropping down. Okay. This is called Markov's inequality. Okay. Markov is the name of a very famous Russian mathematician. Uh, his full name is uh, I forgot. Okay. Andrei Markov. That's full name. So we are going to look at the proof. Okay, the proof is not very long. That's why we are going to look at it today. Okay, so uh, basically e x is integral zero to infinity x f x x dx. We are on slide thirty four. Why is this integral from zero? Non-negative random variable. So, I am going to split this into two sums, 0 to a integral and a to infinity. Now, see, I am going to do some algebra here. Okay? Uh, I am going to take only the second term and ignore the first term. 
Why am I allowed to do this? Because it is non-negative. X is non-negative and fxx is also non-negative because it is a density function. So, it cannot be negative, right. So, this integral is always going to be non-negative and we can therefore write this as greater than or equal to this. Now, I am going to do one more step. x I am replacing by a with an inequality over here. Why can I do this? Okay. So, x is greater than or equal to greater than or equal to a, right, because the integral is from a to infinity. So, the lower bound on x is a and then this is equal to a I can take outside and this is a to infinity p x uh, sorry f x x d x and what is this? This is the probability that capital X takes on a value greater than or equal to a, right. So, it is ulta c d f. The CDF was the probability that x takes on a value less than or equal to a. Here we are doing greater than or equal to a. And this is what you get. So, this is a times blah blah. Okay. So, completing, so e x is greater than or equal to a p x greater than or equal to a. So, when you do the uh, rearrangement, you get p x greater than or equal to a less than or equal to e x divided by a. So, this is called Markov's inequality. Okay. Now, Chebyshev's inequality in this notation, a random variable x with mean mu and variance sigma squared is what we are considering. Then for any value k greater than or equal to 0, uh, sorry greater than 0, we have x minus mu greater than or equal to k probability less than or equal to sigma square by k squared. Okay, so, as you move farther and farther and farther away from mu, the probability that you could have a value exceeding that is dropping down very fast, 1 by k square in fact. The thing that can sort of control the stuff is the sigma square. If that is very high, then this upper bound is also fairly high. Okay. So, Chebyshev's inequality, uh, we have we've done fairly long proofs, but the proof we are going to do now follows directly from Markov's inequality. All right. So, how we are going to regard x minus mu square to be a non-negative random variable that is perfectly fine, it indeed is non-negative. So, we are going to say probability of x minus mu square greater than or equal to k square uh, we is less than or equal to x minus mu squared by k squared. Why is this? I am directly applying Markov's inequality to which random variable x minus mu squared. And this is equal to sigma square by k square because E of x minus mu square is sigma square. Okay. So, this statement is nothing but probability of x minus mu absolute value being greater than or equal to k that is less than or equal to sigma square by k square. Okay. So, using Markov's inequality in one step we can prove Chebyshev's inequality. Okay. So, uh, we will stop for now, we are out of time. Okay. Next class, the first thing we are going to do is that proof for x minus mu absolute value.